Hi everybody, my name is Rob Scott from UC Today and in this session I'm joined by Vaughan Klein, Director and Leader of Collaboration at Cisco. And today we'll be discussing the future of work and what organizations need to consider as we continue forward in this unpredictable landscape. Vaughan, always a good place to start. Would you just tell, tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do at Cisco, please. Hmm. Uh, so I started with Cisco back in January of 2000. Uh, so I've been with the business for a very long time. Uh, and I came up through the Australian organisation uh, to lead the EMEA business, uh, Europe, Middle East, Africa and Russia. I arrived in the UK uh, in this role just 18 months ago. It's gone very, very fast, obviously been uh, an extraordinary period of time. Um, and almost all of that time, you know, collaboration focused. So I represent an architecture, what Cisco refers to as an architecture, which is the collaboration architecture group, um, which is this is all we do, you know, real time communications, you know, voice, video, messaging. Uh, and, um, you know, we have a team of dedicated, a large team of dedicated personnel that handles our customers and our partners for all of their real time uh, communication needs. Great stuff. Thanks, Paul. Um, this is a really interesting discussion today. And so I wanted to kind of just set the scene to start with. And uh, so my first question for you was kind of, you know, what have we learned as a result of this pandemic so far? Uh, what are you seeing from your perspective? Wow. Uh, it's been an extraordinary period of time. The last 90 days, 120 days, uh, you know, unprecedented uh, in the 20 odd years that I've been involved in IP telephony, unified communications and collaboration, uh, Rob. Um, we saw four times the number of users join our WebEx platform as had been the case in February to you know, what's currently being utilised across uh, EMEA at this particular point in time, which is an extraordinary uh, uptake. Um, and it, uh, it really was an amazing thing because Many, many years ago, if I reflect all the way back to when we first commenced the journey around IP telephony, uh, our, our CEO at the time, a gentleman by the name of John Chambers, said, you know, voice would be free. Uh, and of course, that was, uh, that was met with derision uh, and uh, um, a lot of people said, well, that would never happen. But of course, we, we live in an environment now where voice is an application on the network um, and uh, largely runs for free. And then about 10 years ago, uh, our CEO then said, video is the new voice. And again, there was some derision about that. Um, but if anything we've seen in the last 90 days that in fact video is the new voice. We saw over a 9,000% increase in video utilization uh, on our WebEx platform around the world. And it seems quite strange these days, I think, to sit and have a conversation with an audio only style environment, particularly when we're in our home. So the video bit has been the most extraordinary uh, outcome, I think, now that everybody's turned their cameras on. Um, and we've, we've learned to, to get along and to be comfortable visually and to be comfortable with people having a window in our home, to be comfortable in conducting business, you know, with the dog and the children that have been home, uh, or, you know, while trying to eat our noodles at lunchtime, you know, we've, we've had this sort of window that some people could argue is actually you know bonded uh, our workplaces our digital workplaces together more than perhaps it was when we we're all in the office we've sort of had this window on people that we wouldn't ordinarily have seen and the sense of connection as a result of having uh, virtual uh, 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 delivery is actually gone up um, so realistically you know the the, the workplace will never be the same again, uh, would be the sort of summation of, uh, of what we've seen over the past 90 to 120 days. Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it, with the whole kind of virtual collaboration piece and, and how we're, we're now really almost overnight, you know, getting used to using video and virtual collaboration tools uh, mm. like, like WebEx. Um, mm -hmm. So, I suppose what remains to be seen is kind of how will virtual collaboration uh, spaces, com you know, sit with, you know, with or alongside physical spaces going forward? What's your mm. view on that? Mm. So there's a, there's, a, there's a few things uh, to consider. Uh, you know, we, we sort of see three phases to 
organisations assessing what they now need, you know, post the pandemic. Um, the, in amidst the pandemic, the first thing that drove everything was, was continuity. How do we continue to conduct business immediately? Um, and so, you know, we turned our laptop cameras on, done. Uh, and and we're able to transact business and it opened up a whole raft of opportunity um, for us to work in a different way. Um, that provides the second bit, which is sort of the agility of it. You know, have we got the necessary agility within our platforms to do all of these things with a laptop camera? And we'd also like to do a whiteboard. Uh, we'd also like to share a document. We'd like to edit that document. We need to do all of those sorts of things. So the first phase was continuity. The second phase is to ensure that the platform that we're choosing has an aspect of, of agility. And then the third phase of which is the workplace is ubiquity. There's going to be an expectation that we have the same level of experience that we do when we do return to the office, albeit that I think it'll be in shorter time frames per week, um, uh, as we have at home. So we want that ubiquity of experience. The idea that people are going to remain comfortable for eight hours a day staring into a laptop is probably not feasible in our mind. It's quite exhausting and quite difficult and doesn't provide an optimum environment. So the sorts of experiences that we used to generate in the office, in the meeting rooms, is the same sort of experience we're going to want to generate at home. And we're going to get that ubiquity through. So continuity, agility and ubiquity are the things that we're looking at and we're talking to our customers about. And now that they've got through the urgency, they're now reflecting on those matters to say, so how do we do this properly? Um, the other thing that I think will be a definite outcome is, is I, I, I'm very glad uh, that I'm not in the corporate real estate industry at the moment, Rob. I think we'll see a lot of organisations shrink their physical footprint. Um, you know, they're going to they're going to say, well, if everybody's comfortable at home and wishes to continue with elements of their work that is at home, then we're not going to need as much footprint or floor space uh, in our expensive offices. So we're going to we're going to see those shrink most definitely. Um, but I think when we do get to the office, that won't be for individual work. It won't require a desk. We're going to do our individual work, our thinking work at home. When we come to the office, it's going to be the purpose that we need to see people and we need to meet with people. And so yeah, what we'll see that's is a sh shrinking of the real estate footprint, sorry, and a doubling of the number of meeting rooms. Sorry, over to you, Bob. No, I was just going to say, that's a really interesting point that, you know, actually, I always kind of look at the workers and, you know, you've got shallow, shallow work in deep work or focused work. And actually, I do my best focus work when I'm at home. But actually, if I want to do teamwork, then, you know, I need to be in a team environment and maybe that's that's the workplace so mm -hmm. that's really interesting and and you know almost it's kind of a what i've been hearing is like a, this hybrid world um where you know the we'll be working between virtual and uh, and physical spaces but that, it's really interesting so how do you think people are you know work employees are, are going to adapt um to this kind of new way of working mm. and and I think this is the important part. I mean, we've been very fortunate at Cisco in the in the environment that we have. We've been able to make decisions about where we want to work from from the outset. Essentially, um, you know, we've had the, the the power of WebEx within our organisation, and we've been flexible in our work arrangements from the beginning. And most recently, we were voted the number one place to work from a uh, hundred million employee survey. So, you know, that that. Flexibility is an important part of you know, what we offer Cisco employees. And I think what the pandemic has done is now everybody's caught on to that aspect. And so now the question is for the individual to determine where they want to spend their time. If they were a 100% you have to be in the office organisation, they will find, I think, that they'll have less. You might say, well, I only want to be in the office 75% of the time, I want to do 25% at home. Some people might flip it and say, I actually only want to spend 10% in the office and 90% of my time at home. Everybody will find the parameters that best suits them and their work style, their job, and that may even change from week to week. You may have a week of you know, focused work where you need to be away from people in order to complete a particular project, but then you need to convey that project and have a week in the office. The point is, 
It's not all of one or all of the other. It's somewhere in the middle and the individuals will have the capacity now to calibrate uh, what their experience for, with their workplace will be. Um, the important part is just to ensure the fact that at no point in time uh, is that experience derided. So, so if the home environment does not provide a collaboration platform that resembles and reflects an environment that they would and they would ask for and need in their in their office environment, then then, then there's a failing. Um, and we've been really focused on that. We called it better than being there. Um, and the best way I can describe it is if 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 you think about sports, uh, think about your favorite sport. Um, and you want to go and see that sport live, Rob, you 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 go to the game, the atmosphere is there, all the people are there, the players are there, you know, there's nothing quite like being there, being live in the environment. But of course, you can't always go to the game. We can't always get to the office or we can't be in the office in, in New York, you know, or we can't be in the office in Amsterdam. We're going to be doing that in a remote situation. And if we take that sporting analogy and see what's happened with, uh, with uh, the, the TV aspect of that, which is when I'm at home and I can't be live at the game, I get an experience that arguably is better than being there. I get expert reporters uh, telling me about the game that are you know, former captains of the sides. I get slow motion replays. I get the play of the day. I get stats on other games that are going on at the same time that might have a, a ramification on what's going to happen in this game at the end of it. And so we're really, really focused to ensure that that ubiquity of experience exists between the office and home. And in fact, there are certain elements about the fact when you're working at home that reflects something that is better than being actually in the office. And that's where our cognitive play comes about. We've been working on this for uh, nearly two years now, where we provide nameplates, facial recognition. We, we provide a, a uh, insights column where we have a look at the person who we've identified in the video, and we go to the internet and we get all of the publicly available information about that individual, and we put that on the screen at the same time. Um, so that you know a little bit about that person, you can see that person, and even if they're moving around the room, their name tag moves with them. These are all aspects of us creating an environment that's better than being there. And while the pandemic has accelerated it, it's always part of our uh, direction in terms of the development in any case. So we just see amplification of uh, those things that we're working on becoming very, very important. And the other aspect of that, of course, is what we think is going to be important in the workplace is the idea of contactless collaboration, whereby you're not going to want to touch, you know, filthy screens and things in rooms uh, and start your meetings. You're going to want to be able to use voice activation in order to make that work. You, you know, you will say the trigger words, and I won't say it now because it will trigger <laughs> this uh, WebEx session, but you will say your trigger words and then say, start my meeting um, because I'll have walked into the room It'll have recognised who I am, it will have had a look at my calendar, it'll know that I need a meeting, and it will give me the option to say, would you like me to start my meeting? Yes, start my meeting. And we'll do that all utilising our voice and not putting our grubby little hands uh, all over video equipment uh, in the office or at home. So contactless collaboration, again, which is part of our cognitive framework, we think is also going to become really important. And then if we extend that idea just a little bit further, which says, well, with an open API, with my voice, I can change the lights. I can change the air conditioning. I can actually control that entire environment and extend it further, which is given the fact that we're doing uh, room utilization measurement now, we, we will tell you how many people are sitting in a particular meeting room because of the intelligence that we built into our cameras. Well, a meeting room that used to sit eight people might now, as a result of distancing, only be allowed to sit four people and we'll be able to actually trigger something and say, you've got too many people in the room. You need to use social distancing and put four people in another room because this room no longer can accommodate eight. So these are all of the things that are sort of inbuilt on the platform that will start to get uh, innovation to enable these changes. That's really interesting. And, and you know, you. I was going to ask you kind of, you know, more around um, how business, the organisations might need to adapt as well. But I mean, if they've got mm. these technologies and, and you've got mm. the to, you know, to invest in, 
then mm. really that you know they are dare I say pandemic friendly features you know that where you can get away with you know you can deal with the social distancing you can deal with it you know not having to touch the equipment and that kind of thing mm. I think it's a truly innovative and a fantastic application of the technology so in terms of um any other changes do you think the workplace might might need to adapt to accommodate these new work styles is there anything else that you think you know really gonna really gonna need to be thought about you know going forward i think all of those aspects that we discussed rob and i think an, an example an example and that is uh pre uh covid cisco was already uh enacting the principle of reducing their real estate footprint by 50% and doubling the size of their meeting rooms. We'd already started this journey. And the interesting thing to note is when you do that, the uh, the the employee engagement scores went up. Um, so while we're saying you no longer have your own desk, that the environment in the office is more for you to get together and resolve issues uh, and innovate, um, uh, we saw our employment scores go up. We actually saw our badge in rates in terms of the number of people coming into the office actually went up when we reduced the amount of space there was, but we doubled the number of meeting rooms. It's the meeting room technology that really makes it work. Um, and part of that is uh, because we doubled the number of meeting rooms with the technology, there was no scarcity of resource. What happens with most organizations is, is meeting rooms with video technology will get booked and nobody will turn up. Uh, and they might be booked weeks out in advance, and there's somebody desperately trying to find a meeting room in order to conduct an important meeting, but they're all, you know, showing as, you know, we're all in, in, in use, and we know that they're not. Well, that, that habit is because of scarcity. We booked the room because we're not sure we'll ever be able to get a room. But if you double the number of meeting rooms, and you make a good proportion of them, as much as half again, non-bookable, People then know that they'll always be able to grab a room, fire up a video unit, have a conversation, bring three or four people in. And so it's a very, very different dynamic uh, when you move to double the meeting rooms, half the size, and then make half of those meeting rooms non-bookable and you reduce the, the scarcity of the resource. And so that people are actually able to relax and they know they've got a room and then they know they've got the best technology and they're actually able to use them. So look out for that. The, the way that we deal with human nature and scarcity actually being dealt with in the way that we schedule and use meeting rooms. Yeah, and technology you know, plays a major role in, in making all that work, doesn't it? You know, with those new mm. workspaces, workplaces. Uh, so mm. it's really interesting to see how, how, how offices will adapt and change going forward. Um, final question for you today, Vaughn. Um, I'd like to kind of ask you kind of around what role technology plays in the digital workplace and kind of what advice you would give to leaders looking at platforms and providers in this in this space right now. Yeah, so I think the hottest topic at the moment, despite the fact that can we can we work from anywhere? OK, yes, we've proven that that's possible. Um, the very quick second aspect of that is now that we've got an organization's you know unique differentiation it's intellectual property transversing the internet and the network everywhere how do we secure it so the aspect of security becomes a very very important conversation um, and uh, whereas previously you know involved in assessing and consulting with customers about their needs collaboration was big but security wasn't brought into the same conversation it was a separate conversation now it's now it's the same thing so i think as they assess their platforms they will do or should do have security as one of their key objectives in sort of how do we secure this environment another aspect of this which is a little bit old school uh rob and that is the first thing that happens whenever a collaboration session goes poorly is people put their hands on their heads and they say oh what's wrong with my network <laughs> the network actually determines the type of experience that you're going to generate and so be sure to assess your network 
and to make sure that it has that aspect. Obviously, we're a networking organization. You know, the network is largely invisible to users, but actually for those people that are providing the service, there's a, there's a really important part of that. And you saw actually in, in an acquisition, maybe 10 days or so ago, uh, we bought a, an organization called uh, Thousand Eyes. Thousand Eyes is actually about us having visibility on the performance of the internet. You know, right down to your line in your home, how's that performing? Because we very, very quickly saw when all of the utilization and everybody got sent home, how important that last mile is and how we need to be able to watch and maintain and control that uh, in order to deliver the best experience. And so we immediately uh, put forward a significant sum to acquire uh, Thousand Eyes in order to handle that network aspect. Um, and you'll see from us in the next 90 days, you know, technology that's enabling us to to double the definition of the video quality, but actually deliver that at half the bandwidth as well. So security is really important. Network's really, really important. Obviously, the user experience is paramount, but can't be compromised by those two previous things. So the user experience is going to be really, really important. And this aspect of have the user experience uh, uh, cognitive, have it, have it operate in such a way that it's actually asking for verbal cues uh, on things that it already knows that you want and need. Uh, and that's right down to you know, our, our Voicera acquisition. Um, we can actually transcribe an entire meeting now automatically in multiple languages, and you can actually ask it to take, take notes. You can use the trigger words to say take uh, an action, and it'll take actions for you. And so you'll never actually have to take notes in a meeting again. And we're using our cognitive technology in order to do that. So I think there's three pretty good platforms there. Security is important. Um, the network's really, really important. And the UX is important, but not just, you know, nice buttons. It's actually what is the what is the artificial intelligence that's been built into the platform that enables us to, to go above and beyond what we'd usually expect. Fantastic one. And some great takeaways there. Um, it's been really good, good speaking to you today. Uh, thanks for sharing some great insights with us. Um, thanks to everyone for watching. If you've enjoyed today's session, please do give us a quick like or a share on social media. It's always appreciated. But for now, thanks for watching.